Well, thank you very much. And today I'm going to talk about teams and crew resource management. And I'll get into what I mean by each of those terms in a few minutes. So let's think about a factory. So it may have various work groups, a software design group, a hardware design group, a production group, a finance and administration group, and a sales and marketing group. What I mean by work groups is each of the subgroups solves one part of the entire problem. There's expertise within the subgroup. There's little cross-training across subgroups. Between different subgroups. And you know people in your subgroup, but probably not in the other subgroups. And information is shared from one subgroup to the next only on a need to know basis. And when there is communication, it's done in a very formal manner. So work groups work well when you have a complex problem and the process is well defined and there are very few rapid changes. Unfortunately, that is the way the operating room worked when I started my career 25 years ago. The surgeons did their thing, anesthesia did their thing, nursing did their thing. And there was very little appreciation for what each of the different groups were doing outside of their group. So I would like to propose a different way of looking how we work together. So think about a special forces team, a military team. Within a team, there's role clarity. Each person knows what they're supposed to do and be responsible for. And there is a leader who says, this is what we're trying to achieve and assigns the roles in advance. However, when the situation changes, the roles may change. Because of that, there needs to be cross-training. Everybody needs to know a little bit about what everyone else is doing. Mm -hmm. 
So the leader is not necessarily doing the tasks, but he or she needs to have an overview of what's occurring and functions as the communication center. We say communication is centralized. So the way you can think of it is each spoke of the wheel is one person doing a role. And the leader is in the center. And so if this person sees something that he thinks is important, he tells it to the leader so everyone else can hear. And if these two people are unhappy, they don't just complain to one another. They need to tell the leader what the problem is so that he or she can coordinate it being fixed. We say communication is explicit and directed. So one doesn't say somebody needs to give this patient a blood pressure medicine. But rather, I would say, Anya, give this patient one milligram of epinephrine. Alterna and in addition, we use callbacks. So when I say, Anya, give this patient one milligram of adrenaline, she would say, yes, I have given him one milligram of adrenaline. That way, that way, if we don't see a response in the patient, we know it's because they're not responding to the me medication. It's not because the patient didn't get it. We need to use our personnel as well as we can. One needs to be ready to call for help. So, so one needs to change the culture in your organization so that calling for help is seen as the smart thing to do. It's not seen as a sign of weakness. <laughs> Of, uh, it's the smart thing to do. <laughs> Members need to learn to be able to cover for one another. So if I'm managing the airway and I'm having trouble, Anya can help me. <laughs> We have, 
we have to anticipate problems and have resources available. So if I have a patient that I think is going to bleed, I will ask the blood to be in the room. I will not wait until uh, we actually need to give the transfusion. And we have to be open-minded to creative solutions. For instance, if there is no blood available, what can I use instead of blood? Can I cool my patient? Can I give more normal saline? Can I give some other colloid? Uh, just ways to work around not having my resource. Cool down. So we have to reassess and reassess and reassess. So we're asking, are there new problems arising? And that's not just the leader, that's everyone on the team. We are trying to avoid a fixation error. So a great example of that is when we're having trouble establishing the airway, that everyone in the room is focusing on the airway and nobody notices that the blood pressure has gone dangerously low. So how do high performance teams learn these skills and integrate them into their practice? Well, they practice. Think of a sports team. They go out and have practice again and again and again before they play the big game. So I notice you have some simulation exercises on the program today. That is practice. They practice both the entire mission and specific parts. So they, uh, if, if one is trying to improve their trauma team, some of the practice would be Let's pretend we have a patient coming in, how are we going to deal with it? That's the full mission. And they may break it up into small parts. Let's practice doing surgical airways. Let's practice putting central lines or interosseous lines in. They do a team briefing before any mission. They will talk about what their goals are and how they're going to achieve them. Mm -hmm. 
So everyone participates in that. It's not just the team leader. Everyone is encouraged to ask questions and provide input and contribute ideas. Similarly, once the mission is completed, they will debrief, they will talk about how did we do. When they have a success, when they win the game, accomplish the mission, they celebrate it. They say good job. And when they have a failure, they ask, what can we do better next time? So teams excel when tasks are unpredictable and resources are unchanging and goals are changing. So I would suggest that's what surgery is like. That's why a team is more effective than a work group model. Better than the work group model. So, let's think about those sports teams or the military teams. What can we learn? How do we imitate it, emulate it? And how do we integrate that into our day-to-day -day practice? So, I'll talk a little bit about what we've been trying to do at the Mayo Clinic, as well as other institutions around the United States. We do a briefing for each operating room before it begins in the morning. We, we discuss each of the we discuss each of the cases and the patient's individual needs. We do this with the entire team: the surgeons, the anesthesiologists, the nurses, the technicians. They are all there together. We're a very big institution, and so we don't all know one another. And so we begin the briefing simply with introductions. We'll discuss each case and what makes it unique. And that might be anticipated, anticipated bleeding, vascular access, unusual procedures or equipment needs, and the need for ICU post-op if necessary. We've had good luck with that, and it feels like it's made a difference in the flow of our operating rooms. We have had good luck using briefings, and it has had a positive impact on our day-to-day -day function.
We try to do a debrief at the end of each case, even with a routine or successful case. At the end of the surgery. Ideally, you would do it immediately at the end of the case or even during closure. Closing the wound. We cover what went well and what we would do differently if we were doing this case again. We have had pretty good luck using debriefing on cases where there's been a problem. We still have trouble getting people enthused about doing a debrief with a routine or successful case. So let's think about role clarity in a clinical situation. In the operating room, when things are going well, there are clear responsibilities for each team member. But when there's a problem, we may have to change those roles. I may ask my surgeon to stop doing surgery and begin doing chest compressions. I may ask my scrub nurse to quit assisting the surgeon and to help me get a line in. holding instruments. <coughs> and if one member is overloaded, how do we adjust that? So if I have an anesthesiologist who's trying to change the airway and put a line in and give medicines, that's too many things. So, so I may ask the surgeon to put the line in and I may ask one of the nurses to push the medications. As far as communications go, we need to know who is the team leader and the team leader may change. We have to have everybody in the room functioning as one team. So the anesthesia team and the surgical group need to talk and need to work together, not work as two separate teams. We need to know what are the resources available and who can we call for help when necessary. Do we know how to get, rid get hold of cardiology or the intensive care unit or a different kind of surgeon if necessary during a case? Yeah. 
And have we anticipated those needs? Have we planned for them? So for instance, if our general surgeon is taking a big tumor out of the abdomen, and that's very near the inferior vena cava, do they know, do we know that a vascular surgeon is available if necessary? And again, is everyone talking with one another? Have we anticipated some of the other resources we may need? And those resource needs may change throughout the course of the day. So if I'm doing a big case first thing in the morning, I may put fewer lines in than late in the day. Because I know if I run into problems early in the day, there are lots of people around. But if my case is going on in the evening, I may be the only anesthesia person available. Ideal, yes. Do we use if if we're in a problem? Do we use everybody in the room? There should be nobody standing around just watching. We can assign a role to everyone. By global assessment, I mean situational awareness. Does the team leader know what's going on everywhere in the room? If my patient's blood pressure is low, have I wandered around and seen that there's blood all over the floor, or am I simply looking at my monitors? So as a team leader, you should be surveying and looking all around the room, not just becoming distracted by a single task. So this is a picture from a trauma bay in Baltimore. Casualty day. Shock trauma in Baltimore has one of the most sophisticated approaches to taking care of trauma patients. So you see, the team leader is standing here and all he's doing is watching and directing. He's not actually hands-on with anything. There are 10 patients, there are 10 doctors in the room. And every one of them is doing something. So this is a great example of utilizing role assignment and maintaining situational awareness. 
So, when we think of operating room and medical teamwork, just like with us with the military team, we need to practice. And ideally, you would practice with the team you work with. So to do a practice just for the anesthesia team or just for the surgical team is less effective than everybody doing a practice together. We aim to do those preoperative briefings and the post-operative debriefing we celebrate our successes and we analyze and reflect upon our failures so as I said earlier, the main skills that we're aiming for are role clarity. Effective communication. Utilizing and optimizing support. Utilizing our resources in a thoughtful manner. Maintaining a global view. And those are some of the things that will help to make things more effective. Trying to integrate this into your practice will not happen suddenly. It's an incremental approach, and this will take years to really be embraced. So thank you very much.